Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Enzo Kranz and I will uh, present logic metaprogramming for functional languages. So, kind of a tale of mixing two of the most arcane yet powerful programming paradigms. And uh, um, yeah, I'm happy to present that in Scala.io, which uh, will be for a while a kind of prologue.io or cock.io because I won't be talking about Scala at all. Um, but the idea is to still give you some uh, general messages that you can use in uh, your uh, daily developer lives. So first, who am I? Um, I'm a fresh uh, PhD uh, <laughs> graduate uh, from uh, Inria Galinet, and uh, I did my PhD with Mitsubishi Electric uh, in Rennes uh, about uh, metaprogramming for proof transfer uh, in dependent type theory. Uh, I won't be talking about dependent types uh, this early in the morning, don't worry, but uh, Didier will later today. Um, and I worked mainly on the proof, uh, the Coq proof assistant with the Coq LP meta language, uh, which is a logic uh, programming language, and I will present it in uh, this talk. So it will be a kind of experience report and a bit of advertisement for that kind of technologies in general. Um, so. I will talk about uh, the logic programming par paradigm first, then how to encode terms in a functional language uh, with uh, such a logic programming language, uh, lambda prolog. Then I will build a type checker for lambda calculus, and I will end by talking about proof transfer and the cock proof assistant. So let's start with the logic programming paradigm. Um, so this paradigm was born um, thanks to this guy, Robinson. Um, uh, so he pioneered uh, unification, uh, which is uh, the way to find the most general substitution to make two terms equal. So here we have an example of a uh, unification problem between two lists. So it's a prolog syntax. We have one and two in the uh, front and then X is the tail of the list. And uh, for the other one, it's uh, uh, A and Y uh, as the tail. So to unify these, we can uh, just align the values here and find that uh, if we have a equals one and y equals uh, two followed by the tail x, uh, then uh, the problem is solved. And this is the most general substitution because um, here we don't have any uh, further assumption on the values contained in x. Uh, and uh, the other ingredient, uh, um, brought by um, uh, Robinson is resolution, is to find if a set of horn clauses is compatible. So a horn clause can be seen as a kind of normal form for logical formulas. And uh, you have a set of clauses describing your world, what is true, and you add uh, an extra clause and you must find if it's compatible with uh, what's already uh, true. And uh, this was implemented in like the first real life implementation is the prolog, prolog language uh, in 1972 by uh, Kolmerauer and Roussel, so in France. Um, let's see what the prolog language looks like. Um, uh, we have, like in a lot of languages, primitive terms, so numbers, lists are primitive, strings are primitive, and uh, the last one is uh, uh, an atom, called an atom. It's kind of a, a symbol we can use to identify uh, our data and give our information. We have variables, uh, which start with a capital letter. It can be anything starting with a capital letter, and we have compound terms. Uh, comprised of um, an atom first, and then uh, zero or more uh, arguments. And uh, we also have clauses, uh, which are a head and a body. So heads can be uh, without arguments as well. And a body is like that, so with the colon dash. And the logical interpretation of this is, uh, I don't know if uh, you used Prolog before, but um, the idea is that the head of the clause is true if the body can be made true. So it's kind of a premises conclusion, but in reverse. And here we're stating that uh, x is very tall if the height of x is h, and h is over 200, let's say, centimeters tall, for example. Um, and so program in Prolog will be um, a knowledge base first. Uh, so uh, it's a list of clauses we consider true. Uh, so we will call them facts, or they can be conditionally true if we use a body, then uh, it's true only if the body uh, can be made true. 
and then we'll do queries on this knowledge base. So uh, ask the system, is it possible for this query to be true in uh, the world we declared before? And then we will uh, explore in order all the clauses declared in the database and uh, only the one that unify with the, with the query and then uh, find uh, whether the query can be made true. And this is the implementation of resolution. So we'll take an example of Prolog program now. Um, so we still have this declaration of very tall predicate here and what we added here is a list of instances for the height predicate um, with uh, some data. Um, okay, this represents our database. So uh, we say for example that uh, Sarah uh, is 180 centimeter tall. Uh, and then we can ask questions to this system. So, uh, for example, uh, height of John is uh, 180 and uh, we'll take all the um, uh, instances of height in order and we see that none can unify with uh, the query because John doesn't exist in the database. So, uh, Prolog just fails here. A second query we can make is uh, saying that the height of Sarah is X and X is now a variable so it has no information in it. And uh, now the first instance of height will work, uh, modulo unification of X and 180 here. So uh, Prolog succeeds once uh, on that call and we can have a bit more complex queries by uh, combining several predicates to execute in order. So um, we say that we have an X uh, who is very tall and his height or I mean their height is H. And now uh, this will succeed twice. First with uh, Grug, okay, kind of, I don't know, ogre or something really, really big. Uh, okay, really tall, uh, 230. And it will also succeed with uh, Victor, which is, uh, who is uh, 205 centimeter tall. Um, we can also add local information to uh, the context. So uh, every predicate is executed in a context. Uh, it initially just contains the, what was declared in the database, but we can add things locally, such as uh, here I use the uh, arrow here to add uh, uh, an extra case for the height predicate, saying that uh, Alaric is uh, 202 centimeter tall. And then uh, if I call uh, this query, it will succeed with an extra case uh, being the one I added locally. So it's uh, possible to add things locally. So let's now uh, see how we can encode lambda terms uh, in uh, such a kind of language. So first we'll see uh, what is lambda calculus. Um, this guy over here should be our spiritual father. Um, if you don't know him, uh, he is uh, Alonzo Church and uh, he invented lambda calculus, which is defined in the following way. We have uh, three kinds of terms, variables uh, denoted x here, um, function applications, so t applied to u, or abstractions, uh, lambda x t. Uh, it's the function that maps x to t. And uh, it's called a calculus because it has a reduction rule, uh, an only reduction rule called beta reduction. And it says that if we apply an abstraction to a value, then uh, the result is uh, like it reduces to the body of the abstraction with the variable replaced with the value we provided. And this is the basis of functional programming. It's how function applications should work in your favorite pro uh, functional programming language. Um, now, uh, this calculus is minimal, elegant, expressive, and um, it's uh, also very general because, uh, okay, this guy, you must know him, is Alan Turing, and uh, he proved in his PhD thesis that lambda calculus uh, uh, is equivalent to a Turing machine, so it's Turing complete. And uh, he was uh, the uh, student of church above. Uh, now, as an exercise, uh, we won't uh, deep, uh, like dive into the details here, but we can show that it's possible to encode natural numbers, uh, lists, uh, booleans, uh, general recursion, etc., with that kind of language. It's minimal, but it's very, very expressive. Um, so, yeah, you can try this if you want. Um, 
Now, the problem with that definition of lambda calculus is that um, we can write terms um, for which the meaning is really hard to guess. So if we have such a term here, it's kind of hard to guess what it means uh, at the first glance. Um, and we have here y applied to itself and uh, applied in front of the whole uh, term here. So it actually looks kind of bad uh, as a term here. So a solution um, to prevent that kind of meaningless terms to appear is to add types. So we'll switch to simply type lambda calculus now. We add types in front of uh, the variables in the abstraction. So now lambda x of type tau and then the body t. And the types can be simple uh, like variables or arrow types. And now this kind of term, okay, I haven't tried it uh, by hand, but uh, it should be forbidden, like it's ill-typed in uh, such a language. And now we can uh, give ourselves some constants, like uh, type n, constant 0 of type n, uh, constant s of type uh, n to n. And now we can write meaningful uh, terms, like this one is just a function taking a natural number and returning the successor. So it, it, it looks like something uh, with meaning. And it's actually, uh, okay, this is only a Scala term you will see in this uh, talk. So, <laughs> but it, it works the same, like you can write sensible programs with such a language. And now we have a typing judgment. Uh, it reads, in context gamma, uh, T has typed tau. And we'll now uh, study uh, how terms can be made made well typed in such language. So we have typing rules, uh, three typing rules. The first one is uh, the application rule stating that uh, if T has type alpha to beta and U has type alpha, then T applied to U has type beta. It's pretty simple, but must be stated. So in these rules, uh, the top is the uh, list of premises and the bottom is the conclusion. And uh, the context is just a list of associations between variables and types. So for the variable case, uh, if there's an association in gamma, then of course x is well typed. And for the lambda case, um, here uh, if we, like uh, an abstraction will have an arrow type because it's a function uh, from alpha to beta, if we can add uh, locally to the context uh, variable x of type alpha, and with that extended, extended context, type uh, the body T in beta correctly. So these are our um, three typing rules for lambda calculus. Um, and now we'll see how to encode them in a logic uh, programming language. So uh, we'll first extend prolog to lambda prolog because uh, it's better to add types and functions to such a language. So uh, I used, by the way, the LP implementation, which is a uh, uh, an implementation that's uh, suitable for uh, using uh, Coq proof assistant. So uh, here uh, we go. We define our um, lambda terms as a new type in lambda prolog. So type called lambda term, and it can be either an application, lambda term, lambda term, and returning a term, or can be a lambda. And here the lambda is represented with a function uh, in the lambda prolog function. Uh, taking a term, so the x, and returning the body, uh, t. So this encoding is called higher order abstract syntax. And uh, it also means we don't need a case for variables because we just use the functions of the meta language. So let's see an example here. Uh, lambda x, lambda y, uh, x applied to uh, lambda z, uh, y applied to z. Uh, this is encoded as the following term in lambda prolog. So uh, we have a lambda, a lamb constructor every time there's a lambda, but uh, after the lamb constructor, the argument is a function. So the backslash here is a function in meta prolog, uh, in a lambda prolog, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so here x is just a variable in the meta language directly. We don't have a var case uh, in our type uh, encoding for lambda terms, and it allows things to be always uh, well scoped and like we cannot add uh, another non-existent variable here. Uh, it must refer to something defined before. So uh, there are alternatives uh, to HOAS. Uh, we can cite uh, named variables, for example. 
um, we can cite uh, De Brown indices or levels. So in the case of named variables, uh, you just add a string every time you cross a lambda. You give the name of the variable, and then you have a var case in your AST, and um, you must have the, the, the right string. Uh, and in the case of the uh, Brown indices or levels, uh, you use um, integers to represent uh, variables. So um, uh, according to indices or levels, it's, it's in one way or the other. I can come back to this. But um, what we need to uh, remember here is that um, here we can use string t0, for example, in the middle of a term. And uh, the term will be uh, ill-formed. And it's still accepted in the meta language. And for the brand indices or levels, we can use four at some point. And uh, it doesn't refer to anything. The term is uh, ill shaped, but it's accepted. So the idea was to uh, make illegal states unrepresentable. And uh, uh, this is easier with HOAS. So now we have the um, um, ingredients to write a type checker. So um, let's represent simple types in Lambda Prolog. So we define another type called lambda type, and we'll give uh, a case arrow for the arrow type, taking two lambda types. Um, and here is how um, such a type would be encoded. So um, A and B here are, so capital A, capital B, uh, they are variables in uh, lambda prolog. So it's the meta languages uh, variables. Uh, we don't need a case, uh, okay, once more, uh, for variables, because we use the ones of the meta language. And now we can build a, um, a predicate called type of that takes a lambda term and returns a lambda type. So let's see how we can implement the typing rules. Um, here for the application rule, we can just write the following code. Uh, it's just um, like it reads really easily. We, we just swap the conclusion and premises, and it's literally uh, translatable into Lambda Prolog. So an application T, U is of type B if uh, T is of type A to B and U is of type A. For the Lambda case, um, now we have to remember that um, Lambdas are represented by functions in the meta language. So to access the body of the function, the T term in the rule, we need to apply uh, f at the meta level. So here we, with the pi operator in red, we introduce locally a new variable x. And uh, with the arrow, we will uh, assume that uh, its type is a. And in that extended context, we will type uh, the body of the function with type b. Um, and once again, no case for variables, because we just saw in the lambda case that every time you cross a variable, you invent a new uh, fresh local constant, and um, you add information to your context. So it means every time we will cross a variable, it, it, it will find uh, the right case in the context. Now let's do an example. Let's try to type the following term, lambda x, lambda y, x applied to y. We'll put the uh, typing rules here implemented uh, on the side. Uh, and this is our goal. Um, so I'll split into three parts, uh, the queries on the top, and then the, what's added locally to the context and what's uh, added as unification constraints on the side. So we need to type this term. So it's a lambda. So le, the first case of type of will uh, fail to unify, but the second case will work. Um, and uh, here we'll say that, OK, uh, um, variable ty, which is the global type we're uh, waiting for um, to type this term, will be unified to a narrow type, because uh, that's what the head of the clause for uh, the lambda case uh, um, forces. So here you go. ty equals arrow ab, with ab being fresh variables here. Um, we don't know anything about them. And then uh, we uh, enter the, the body of the predicate and we invent a new variable. So z0 is a fresh constant. And we add to the context that it has type A. And now the goal changed uh, into a type of uh, the rest of the term, but with x replaced with z0. And we need to type this in B. So same case, we enter the lambda case again, and we'll say that b is a narrow type. And we have to 
now type the function application with uh, an additional local variable z1 added to the context with type c. Now, the lambda case is not the one we are, we are going to use because it's an application, so we'll enter the first case now, and the query becomes two split queries. So Z1 must have an arrow, Z0 must have an arrow type, and Z1 must uh, have the same time as the domain of Z0. Um, and these cases don't go through the code we wrote uh, for the type checker. It goes uh, through the cases uh, added locally to the context. So that's why I said we don't need a case for variable in the type checker. So Z Z0 has type A. Uh, this will be selected for the first goal. Uh, modulo unification of A and uh, E to D. And for the second case, it works if C equals E. Okay, so now um, there's no query anymore, so it means uh, the type checker succeeded. And now to reconstruct our ty global type, we can just do uh, substitutions here and say, okay, let's remove e, replace a with its value, replace b with its value, and we have it here. Uh, the type of this term is uh, c to d uh, to c to d. And uh, it makes sense, like we take x, which is a function, we don't really know the types c and d, uh, but it's a function, and then we take an argument to that function and we apply it, so the argument must have type c and the global result will have type d. So it makes sense. Now we can see that um, it's good to have added typing, but in the case of simply type lambda calculus, in a way it kind of killed expressivity in our language. So. Um, uh, for example, the general recursion operators of um, lambda calculus, such as the Y combinator or um, omega, etc., uh, are ill-typed in simply typed lambda calculus. So um, we could want to extend our language and write a type checker for something bigger, uh, because typing is decidable for a bigger fragment. Uh, for example, the what we call the ML sweet spot. Uh, so very expressive, yet uh, no type annotations required in the general case. I mean, if you use the GADTs uh, Xavier presented yesterday, uh, you probably need type annotations, but in the general case, uh, in a language such as OCaml, you don't need uh, any type annotation. So uh, we could um, actually uh, want to build a type checker for that. So we just define a, a type for monomorphic types here. And here we can add our favorite um, cases for the monomorphic types. Uh, we can add pairs, lists, and the arrow type. And then we'll say that a lambda type is now either a monomorphic type or a polymorphic type, uh, which once again exploits the HOAS format. Um, it takes a function, uh, and basically it's like, give me um, give me a monomorphic type and I will build you a lambda type. So give me an alpha and I can return alpha to alpha for identity, for example. So it can encode for polymorphic types. We can add more constructions to our language, such as um, having constant integers or uh, global references, such as the successor function for natural numbers. Um, and now, if we want to encode other constructions, like a let binding, um, it's also possible in HOAS here, uh, involving a function again. So the let binding here um, uh, binds uh, x to 34, and then we can use the variable x at the meta level to express uh, the uh, right-hand side of the let binding. So now, um, I, I don't have time here for the whole technical details, because I, I also want to talk about uh, proof transfer and the cock proof assistant, but um, a full type checker for uh, the ML fragment uh, requires uh, some specialization. So if a term uh, has a polymorphic type, it can be used in the context, uh, like a weaker context where the types are specialized, and it requires some non-local reasoning as well. Um, so these are technical details, but uh, the thing to remember is that um, at, at the heart of the algorithm, it's still based on inference rules. So um, in a logic programming, it's very elegant in the implementation, like it's very short. Um, and uh, I have 
said it before, but we can do more than a type checker because uh, as ML doesn't require all types to be annotated, it means that when the user enters a type in such language, it's incomplete. It lacks some uh, type annotations on the lambdas, for example. So it's incomplete, and the type checker is actually more than a type checker because it does both checking and inference. So it checks that the general shape of the term you gave is correct, but it also tries to fill the remaining uh, parts. So it's called an elaborator. And uh, this guy is Enrico Tassi, uh, permanent researcher at INRIA, and he's the guy who uh, implemented LP. Uh, the N LP implementation of Lambda Prolog, and his ultimate goal is to build an elaborator for the cock proof assistant, um, which is a much harder um, version of Lambda Calculus. <laughs> so now I will switch to uh, proof transfer in the cock proof assistant. So maybe I should drink a bit. Sorry, so uh, to introduce the cock proof assistant, let's uh, introduce proofs first. What's a proof? So a proof is a logical uh, object, structured log logical object. You have a statement T you want to prove, um, some hypothesis, H1 to HN, and with a lot of logical steps uh, of reasoning, um, you increase the amount of true stuff until it includes your statement T you wanted to prove. And then you say QED, CQFD in French, and uh, it means that your proof is done. Um, in an abstract point of view, it means that you're building a sequence of correct steps from an initial state S1 to a final state SF, um, and uh, these steps are correct proof steps, so your proof is correct. But um, what's the definition for correct? Well, it's something quite social. Uh, based on trust between humans. So we all agree on a set of uh, reasoning rules that uh, seem correct together, uh, such as the following one, which is very old. All men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. And uh, with such rules, we can like pack them to, into a document called the logical system, uh, which describes all the proof steps that can be accepted as uh, correct proof steps. And the idea uh, at the heart of a proof assistant is to take this logical system and implement it in what's called a kernel. So uh, a small uh, code base um, that uh, encodes the rules of reasoning of the logical system. Uh, and the developers of this kernel always make sure that the kernel is consistent. It means that um, it, uh, it is... Um, a correct implementation of the logical system and that uh, you cannot prove a contradiction with this kernel. And then you define a programming language associated to this kernel, so with definitions, uh, uh, recursive types, or um, you can state theorems. Uh, and then you need to prove what you stated uh, for theorems, so you need another language called the tactic language. And every tactic is like the proof steps uh, I showed on last slide. Uh, so you can do case analysis, apply hypotheses, etc. Call some automation tools as well, and then in the end you get a proof object, uh, which is a proof term in a very advanced lambda calculus, and it's sent to the kernel for verification, type checking, and uh, if the kernel agrees, then your proof is correct, and uh, you can trust it uh, if you trust the logical system as a correct basis. Uh, for logical reasoning, and if you trust the kernel implementation. So if, from the moment you trust the kernel, you trust everything that the, the kernel type checks, and that's the interest of a proof assistant. And these ingredients, a kernel, programming language, and tactic language, uh, are uh, what makes the proof assistant, I mean the cock proof assistant at least. And with that, you can verify results in both mathematics and computer science, and it's used in uh, like critical industries, like nuclear or uh, aerospace engineering, for example. Um, let's do a short demo in Coq. Is it big enough here? Um, 
do you prefer like okay is dark mode fine or yeah okay so here you go proof uh, cock proof assistant okay it will be quite hard to execute and and talk at the same time uh, here we are stating our theorem uh, commut commutativity of addition uh, on the uh, nat type here for natural numbers um, so here it appears as a goal we need to prove so we can enter the proof enter the proof mode and now we can just list our tactics one by one to make proofs so um, First, we'll do an induction on the m value here, saying, OK, m is a natural number. It can be either a zero or a successor of a given k, uh, for which the property is already true. So by executing induction here, uh, we now split the goal into two parts. The first one is the zero, and the second one is the successor. And we'll have an additional uh, hypothesis for the successor case. We'll see it uh, in a while. So first, uh, the case with uh, the zero, we'll do again an induction on n. So it splits the first case into two parts, one where n is also zero, and the other part where n is some successor of p with the property being true for p. Uh, so in the first case, we can just see this is a reflexive equality, so it's trivial, we just call reflexivity. And inside it applies the reflexivity constructor of equality. If you remember the talk about uh, EQ in the GADT talk by Xavier yesterday, it's a, a slightly more advanced version of this EQ type, but the constructor for equality is a, a reflexivity uh, constructor as well. And it's applied here uh, behind the scenes. Uh, so now we focus on the second case where um, N is a successor of P. And here we, we can see that um, a, a hypothesis were, was added, EP, um, saying that 0 plus P equals P plus 0. So first what we'll do is exploit the definition of um, addition here, saying that uh, if we add something, um, if we add 0 on the left-hand side, it, we just return uh, the um, right-hand term. So 0 plus SP will change to just SP. And, uh, if we have a successor on the left-hand side, it's just successor of uh, here p plus zero. So computing the uh, addition here with the simplify tactic, simple, uh, will yield the following goal. sp equals sp plus zero. And then we can use the induction hypothesis ep to rewrite p plus zero into zero plus p. Simplify again to remove the zero. And then we can conclude this proof with reflexivity. OK, and now we have the, the second case, but the second case for M. Like the proof is structured with bullets. So now we go back to the second case for M, uh, which is now successor of K. And OK, I won't detail this proof, but I will just go to the QED. And once QED works, like uh, appears in green, it means that Cog validated our proof. And so now the theorem is true and we are happy. Um, now, um, I want to talk about proof transfer. So here we use the NAT encoding of uh, natural numbers, uh, which is the zero and successor encoding. But we could use another uh, encoding here, uh, which is called N. Uh, and I will print the definition of n. n is either uh, zero here or some positive here and positive is a strictly positive binary numbers so I will show it as well it's a stream of uh, 0 or 1 ending with a, a, a 1 so it's forced to be a strictly positive binary number and we say that n is either 0 or this type 
And it means it's an encoding of um, binary numbers as um, uh, it's an encoding of natural numbers in a binary mode, sorry. And so we have the same theorem to prove on the N encoding. We might want to apply what we already proved on uh, the natural number, uh, the first encoding, the piano style encoding. But unfortunately, it does not work here. And Cox says, uh, the command has indeed failed with message, unable to unify what we gave with what we need. So uh, it's exactly the same property, but expressed on NAT uh, on one side and N for the other side. Um, so the proof transfer problem is the following. We have uh, our proof uh, for the NAT encoding, and we would like to have the same proof on the uh, N encoding. But um, we don't have a way to actually go from one proof to the other to change the encoding uh, used in one proof. So at this point, proof reuse is just wishful thinking. Um, so we need some proof transfer tool. Uh, so we'll take our initial goal G1 expressed, for example, with um, the N encoding we showed. And the proof transfer tool that we want to build will generate uh, what we call an associated goal G2, which is exactly the goal, the same, but written in the NAT encoding. So it will align with what we have already proved before. Then we do our easier proof. So uh, in this case, it's a pre-existing proof we, because we just want to apply uh, the result on NAT, but uh, it could also be some uh, automation tool that works better on one encoding or the other. And once we have the proof of G2, the proof transfer tool uh, provides us uh, a transfer proof allowing to go back to uh, a proof of G1. So this is what uh, I worked on during my thesis. Uh, and I developed two tools. I won't give uh, a lot of details about them, but uh, the first one is called Tract, and it's based on uh, what we call goal canonization. So it takes a bunch of encodings, possible encodings for integers, and rewrites the uh, statement we have to prove uh, in uh, the one standard encoding. Uh, so Z is the standard binary integer. Um, so also containing the negative part of uh, integers. And uh, everything is expressed on Z, and then we can run automation on Z. And it exploits some proofs given of isomorphism or embedding between the source and the target type, so NAT to Z, for example. Uh, it works for one theory, so for example, arithmetic and uninterpreted functions. So it, it's, it's a bit closer to the SMT fragment. It was integrated into a plugin for the Coq Proof Assistant, connecting the Proof Assistant to SMT solvers. So um, it, it was successfully integrated into SMT Coq. And the second one is called TROC. It's a generalization. It's based on parametricity, which is uh, way too technical for now. Um, and it subsumes several existing approaches. And the important thing is that uh, it supports the full monster in Coq, so polymorphism and dependent types. Let's go, go back quickly to uh, the demo in Coq just to show one of the tools uh, how they work. Um, so I'll go back to here. OK. Um, so here, applying adcom failed for the n case, but what we can do is define a function n of nat and a function n to nat and say that um, they cancel each other. They are inverses. So we can prove that in Coq. Uh, I didn't show the details of the proof, but okay, the proofs are here. Um, and add this embedding to the track tool with a command. Then we can add some morphism lemma for addition, saying that n to nat of the addition on Binary numbers is like adding in the uh, piano encoding the n to nat uh, cast of each value, n and m. We can add this to the tool as well. Uh, we can say that equality over um, the n type is equivalent to the equality over the nat type modulo uh, addition of n to nat function. And now that all this information is added, we can try to prove our uh, theorem on n 
by just running tracked first. And here you see the goal has changed because the track tactic uh, actually built a proof term explaining to the cock proof assistant that um, if I can prove the property on NAT, uh, then it implies the property on N. And now we can apply our AdCom theorem and it works. And then the proof is finished. Uh, I want to stress here that it's, it's, it's not just um, uh, like traversing the AST of the goal and changing all the NAT or N to the other one. Um, in a proof assistant, you must justify everything. So uh, you generate a, a bit of the output goal, but also a proof term at the same time. So if I show the proof that was made here, um, No, no, it's not. <laughs> it's, it starts here. <laughs> uh, but here we can see that um, all this term here was added in front of the AdCom theorem we, uh, we call in the end here, uh, down there. So we call AdCom, but it, not, it does not work magically. The, the track tactic had to build a whole term here explaining to the proof assistant why uh, it's correct. Uh, and a, a, a fun fact is that uh, uh, the truck tool is also expressed as inference rules, now much heavier than what we saw in this talk, but it, it means that the, the implementation remains transparent in a logic programming language. So uh, it's really one, uh, it's the key message I wanted to convey in that talk. So yeah, let's conclude. Um, so some messages you can take away from that. Uh, first, we are very lucky in our domain. Functional languages are built on a very solid basis, uh, which is not the case for all domains, but yeah, we are, we are lucky. Uh, the HOAS encoding we showed, so higher order abstract syntax, uh, can be very handy for metaprogramming because uh, you use inference rules that you implement uh, very clearly in a logic programming language. Uh, and now some um, um, more general um, facts about uh, proof assistance. Uh, if you want a very expressive lambda calculus, you must add dependent types, but uh, you get a very hard uh, type system, like very hard to study both in theory and in practice. And that's why uh, proof transfer automation and that kind of tools are kind of trying to add grease to the gears uh, to make it easier to use, but it's very hard. And uh, last one, in the dark rooms of type theory labs lie the future innovations that will trickle down to your favorite programming languages. So we can already see that functional programming, uh, in a way, has already won, but uh, it has not finished winning, like it's still going on. All right, thank you uh, for your attention. And if you want to, um, like if you're interested in it, you can read the first part of my thesis, uh, which is available uh, online. And the first part is like, what, like presentation of Cock Proof Assistant and not too technical, I hope, so uh, you can read it if you want. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for the presentation. Can you go back to slide 22? I think it's 22, where you show the, the diagram of going from the piano integers to the binary encoded integers? Yes, yes. So if I understand, maybe my understanding is naive, but you, you, had, you had something that was proven in, I forget if it's G1 or G2, and you wanted it proven in the G2 representation, so you constructed a, a bijection between these. Um, it's actually um, G1, is what you need to prove right now. Yes. So uh, in our case, uh, maybe I was not clear enough on that point. Thank you for the question. Um, G1 is the goal expressed with the N encoding, so the binary one. So it's the one we have to prove now. Right, and right. G2 will be like, we'll, we'll use the proof transfer tool to go back right, to so, a goal so that exactly matches what we have already proved before. Right, so my question is, if I understand, you're, you're uh, approach was you constructed a bijection between the two, the two uh, representations. Um, you, sh you show that you can get one from the other and the other from the one, right? Um, 
Yes, but not necessarily a bijection. Actually, uh, in a lot of cases, you just need an embedding. Like uh, this was my the, question. Right, yeah, right, the two functions. This is the more the, common case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did not show that in uh, the demo, for example. But you could have uh, um, you could have a property proved on um, the Z type. So the whole uh, uh, integers and have something to prove on natural numbers and then you go back to integers because the more general property was proved on the bigger type. And here the transfer is not bijective, it, you just have an implication on one side, so uh, you can have uh, non-bijective embeddings. Thank you very much Enzo.